Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 11 Days of Global Unity. We are so thrilled that you could be here with us for the 15th anniversary of 11 Days of Global Unity, 11 themes to change a world, to help the world be a world that works for all of us. I'm Karen Palmer. I'm known as Mindful Media Mom and Miss Kindness, and I get to be co-hosting this amazing summit with my incredible co-host, the founder of We The World. You can find him at we.net. And we the World is a global platform to unite and amplify the efforts of people and organizations and movements working for the common good. Rick is the co-creator of the 11 Days of Global Unity, 11 ways to change the world, linking local awareness and action campaigns into an inspiring international movement with participants including Desmond Tutu, Jane Goodall, Marianne Williamson, Deepak Chopra, Bill McKibben, and many more. Welcome, Rick. It's great to be on with you, Karen, as always. And we're going to have a wonderful broadcast today. I'm so excited. Uh, let me tell folks about you. Um, our host is Karen Palmer, a mom who made a wish that sparked a kindness revolution. She is a global kindness leader and educator, and you can connect with her through Global Kindness TV. Dot org. She is also a live stream and social media expert, a best-selling author, and she co-produces several popular online talk shows, including the Welcome to We Show, which is a monthly show. Um, so thank you, Karen. And thank you all so much for joining us today. We encourage you to check out all the, the panels of our 11 Days of Global Unity Telesummit on the uh, 11 Campaigns for Change. Together they form a blueprint for global transformation. Today we will be talking about freedom, democracy, and the importance of making sure that the voice of the people is heard at the highest levels of power, such as at the United Nations. And today to d discuss this, we are excited to be joined by Earl James. Earl James is a veteran of over 40 years of nonprofit coalition building and political activism for social change in the areas of global peace and security, environmental protection, and public health. Currently, he is president of Global Voice, and you can reach him at globalvoice.solutions. He is a board member of the Common Home of Humanity, and Earl has been on We the World's advisory board for over 10 years. From post-war Bosnia and poverty-stricken Eastern Kentucky to the halls of Congress and the United Nations, Earl James has worked on the ground and in the corridors of power to help secure a just and democratic world for all. Welcome to the 11 Days of Global Unity Telesummit, Earl James. Welcome, Earl. You gotta unmute yourself. You're muted, Earl. Uh, uh, there, how's that? Okay, thank you so much. It's um, even all those years, I still haven't learned to use technology very well. But <laughs> no problem. It's so, great, great to be here. Uh, yes, it's great to have you. Uh, so, Earl, can you please tell people about your work with Global Voice, including the Global Town Hall series, the latest Global Town Hall in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, um, plans for 2020, and how this can affect the United Nations and freedom and democracy in general around the world. I certainly will. In fact, I just came off another organizing phone call before this meeting, and uh, the uh, Global Town Hall started last year in July at the University of Colorado Boulder, 
We had our first event. And we were able to network with the European Union, European Union Center of Excellence at Boulder, uh, which you know, immediately brought in uh, the ambassador, UN ambassador to the EU ambassador to the US. And we're networking in the Pittsburgh uh, Center for Excellence also. So uh, we've got um, a wide variety of speakers that come in, uh, and everyone who has participated so far in not only being a panelist and speaker, but through people around the world online live streaming the events, has shown great interest in what's happening at the UN in uh, 2020. It's the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. The NGO community, non-government organization community, is, is working very hard uh, to make the voice of the people through non-governmental organizations be much, much stronger at the UN. In 2015, the, um, a report came out recommending over 85 reforms at the UN. This report was put together by folks working with uh, U.S. former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright and a Nigerian Foreign Minister Ibrahim Gambari, uh, and with a, a, a group of experts. One of the strongest recommendations they made was to formalize a much stronger rec uh, relationship between UN decision making and the non-governmental organization community. Right now, you know, the NGOs we lobby hard, we pressure, we put on events, dance, sing, whatever, get the attention, you know, but it's all, you start over every time, you know, and so uh, I'm happy to say from my uh, recent conversation with uh, folks like Richard Ponzio, who, who will be speaking at the Pittsburgh event, um, that there's a very formal organizing going on right now uh, to create an NGO forum that is up and running year round, that's going to, in, in, uh, in September of next year, at the 70th anniversary, make a very strong play for formalizing this relationship. This could change the way the UN operates, right? It won't be easy to make it happen. Because as you know, the UN, even though the prologue says we the peoples, it's really we the nation states. Uh, so this is the big hurdle to overcome. And I'm just happy to say there's a lot going on. So uh, to talk about the um, Pittsburgh Global Town Hall, that, uh, that's all day on the Friday, the 20th of September at the University of Pittsburgh. And uh, just prior to that, on the 19th, there will be a student town hall to discuss UN reform issues and educate students at, at Pitt on that. And then in the uh, evening of the, third, of the 19th, uh, there will be a, an address uh, by Paulo Magalhães uh, of the Common Home of Humanity. And uh, Paulo started the Common Home of Humanity nonprofit less than a year ago. It is a global environmental governance initiative. It has been involved as a lead organization already with the UN Environment Programs, Dialogues Toward a Global Pact for the Environment. All right, and this, I want to just take a, a moment and explain what that is about, because this is another really interesting and uh, opportunity that's coming from the UN, all right? In other words, we don't have to dance and sing and wave arms to get the UN's attention on this. They already got it. And the United Nations Environment Program this spring hosted dialogues in Nairobi, Kenya, on the theme of a global pact for the environment. They see the need to have a global treaty for the environment because environmental law right now is scattered. It's, it's regional, it's local, it's national. It doesn't uh, integrate, doesn't work together. And so this is an, because of the pressure of climate change, yeah. telling us this species that we belong to, get it together now or forget it. Right? And everybody's feeling that. Everybody with their ears open and their eyes open knows that. That pressure and this initiative by the UN is and a wonderful global governance reform opportunity. And uh, very briefly, 
we were asking the UN General Assembly in September to pass a resolution to formalize a two and a half year process towards the summer of 2022 when a global treaty could be adopted by UN members. That's awesome. That's amazing. It's, yeah. It, so do you we, feel in, in do you feel kind of that people are feeling more empowered by the work that you're doing? Do you feel that it's really opening up the the average American to feel more empowered by sharing their voice at these town halls? Absolutely, absolutely. They 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 are very eager to learn about what's going on. There's so many things going on in the UN and the non non governmental community that you know you don't hear about unless you're inside and part of it so the global town hall dialogues is very helping to get that information out and get a platform for people to jump on board and uh, like let know, to get involved in a town hall too yeah yeah and it, we are live streaming all of the pittsburgh global town hall oh great what page will that be live streamed on is that well, on a facebook page there's a Facebook uh, page. There's and uh, Rick, I know you've posted the uh, program with the live stream links on we we.net. Oh, great! And, uh, then we'll just be promoting that too through Facebook and Twitter, and, and already doing that. So uh, that's anybody around the world <clears throat> can join that. That would be yeah, great. Feedback through Twitter, the the usual process, you know. And so we found that in, in, in the Bull Town Hall in, in Colorado, that we had a lot of people you know, join and comment from different parts of the world through the Twitter feed, <coughs> excuse me. And um, so we have this, this town hall, and let me just briefly tell you a bit about what's going on at that Pittsburgh town hall. Uh, I mentioned the opening uh, lecture on Thursday evening the 19th by uh, Paulo Miguel Hayes of Common Holy Humanity. He'll be speaking for 45 minutes or so, explaining what the Common Holy Humanity is, how it works, and so forth. It'll be a good, good information piece. And then on Friday, we have an all day event. And the provost of the University of Pittsburgh uh, will do a welcome ceremony, and I will come on and give an overview of the road to 2020, what it's all about, kind of what I'm talking about now. Uh, I hope you have an exciting slide deck with it. <laughs> and, uh, and then we'll go into an expert panel to discuss climate change, gender, and sustainable development. Some really good people. I won't go over all their names right now because you can see it on the, on the program. Um, but that's at 10 o'clock. And then really exciting at noon, the keynote luncheon address, Wanjari Mathai of the Wanjari Mathai Institute for Peace and Environmental Studies. Yeah. I recognize the name. Her mother started the um, Green Belt Movement in Africa. Oh, right. Um, yes. Supporting that. That's going to be a really thrilling talk. Yes. I remember that children's book about her doing yes. this. Yeah, yes. that's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. And, so, and, you know, yeah. Wangari Mathai was a, was a uh, supporter of the WE campaign as well. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. Well, who is it, Rick? <laughs> and she, and, no, she's going to be the keynote speaker? No, 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 no. She's not around anymore. No, the daughter? Oh, her daughter. Oh, daughter. Yeah, the, that's, the, what I, I, that's what I, I knew. I, I met uh, the daughter. Yeah, <laughs> I knew she had, I knew she had passed. I, 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 yeah. We share that children's book a lot. Um, I share really? that a lot when we start doing our tree planting programs. Great. Yeah, yeah. And... Uh, uh, Andrea Mathai is also participating in New York the following week, and especially on the 28th, there is a global landscape forum where she's a speaker, among others, all about restoration of the earth, wow. forest restoration, etc. Which is that seems like that really is the a big solution, the restoration. It seems Absolutely. like reparation and and restoration, and we we need to really look at how we can do things differently. Is is what it seems like a lot of the solutions come as very much so. And the nature based solutions is kind of the hashtag theme that's that's prominent. Oh, oh now great nature based solutions! I love that. I, I'm a hashtag girl, so I'll put that I'll put that as our hashtag now. And uh, the restoration theme, you know, there's, there's estimates that there's over the next 10 years, there's up to 
17 trillion dollars market for restoration around the world. This is for you know businesses to begin investing in restoration yeah. and, and get payback from that. So it's amazing how the economy is opening up to what we need. And we need to get people to pull their money out of fossil fuel investment and into restoration. And Can you talk you, about that a little bit? I was going to say, how would you suggest that we, we promote that? Right. Yeah. And, and, and tell us what kind, what's the nature of the restoration or some examples? Well, the World Resources Institute right now is, is doing some work in, in Central America and Africa, some pilot projects. And again, it depends on a, a region, what the landscape of that region is. Uh, almost everywhere you see a need for reforestation. You know, because we, in our human history, we, we've uh, eliminated half the natural forest that we are when we appeared on the scene. And doing that, of course, your trees don't grow instantly, you know, so it's a longer process. But uh, in, over the 10 years, we might have to get it right with the environment. You know, if you, trees are planted right now, which many people are doing, they, over that 10 years, they can be absorbing a lot of carbon. Mm -hmm. So the big restoration piece is around reforestation. And then there's water in, uh, in ecosystems. Uh, how water has been diverted, <coughs> excuse me, into and dammed, rivers dammed and so forth. Uh, and they're restoring natural ecosystems of all kinds. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's been estimates that through restoration of ecosystems, we could uh, absorb 50% of the carbon needs to be absorbed. Wow. That's and then if you add reducing emissions to that, yes. the, we can get there through nature-based solutions and technology. Um, so, you know, there, there are a lot of solutions everywhere. It's amazing. Um, just in my home state of New Mexico, which is produces a lot of oil and gas for the U.S. Um, there was a um, article yesterday in the paper about the oil and gas industry is saying, well, we need $174 billion in infrastructure investment in order to tap all of our reserves. Well, we're not gonna do that, of course, because we have, now we have a new governor who understands New Mexico is in the Sun Belt. And if we put a few billion dollars infrastructure investment into solar energy, we'll yeah. produce more energy than all the fossil fuels will. So, right. so, so that, that brings up the, the whole political component and where movement building is important. Because as you know, there are some people who are still holding on to short-term uh, uh, profit taking at the expense of the whole uh, sustainable or si sustainability of the, of the planet. Sure. And so, and, and I'm, I'm trying to understand also how we can get to the point where these reforms for the UN can be manifested um, with those people who, or let's say um, the, the ones who are, are in the highest positions of power, they want to hold on to that. Uh, power, uh, which is not necessarily reflecting what uh, common uh, common humanity would would like to see. So, how do you propose that that these these kinds of things take place? And I certainly have an answer myself. Or if I'm just wondering how your work, you know, takes that in, into a, account. You know, the wonderful solutions that you're talking about restoration. And yet, if uh, the political will isn't, isn't there at the highest levels, then how do we do that? Right, which is <clears throat> always the question on uh, progressive reform and um, making sense of our lives instead of chaos and, and ruining our lives. You know? It's a political will question. But I think, well, for example, organizations like 350.org and their divestment campaign, right? There's an excellent model. They've been pressuring universities among other institutions around the world, you divest from fossil fuels. 
And not only is that pressure divestment, it also is an educational piece. People hear about that. Right? And they're making progress there. That's one type of thing. Uh, we put that kind of information and solutions out during the, the global town halls uh, so people know what's going on, so they can jump on it and be part of it. And a lot of it is right now, Rick, is communication. You know, getting the word out of not only the different solutions that are out there, but how these different solutions are beginning to come together. Yeah. To integrate. Right. For example, with the Global Landscape Forum on, on the 28th of September. Um, I recommend people get online and look at Global Landscape Forum. Just search that. It's amazing what they're doing. This is where a whole lot of movements and information and solutions are coming together around restoration, for example. Beautiful. Uh, so from the best I can do in the Global Health Town Hall uh, perspective, you know, is get that word out. Um, and then I'm going to be attending the September 28th Global uh, Landscape Forum in New York, along with Paula McGalhays of the Common Home of Humanity. Um, and there's live streaming also, so people can live stream uh, or attend and apply to intent in person. And they have a limited number of people, but for in person, it can be live stream. So that's something you, we might put out you know, to advertise, um, because who hears about that? So few people. Right. The UN tries to get the word out, but the conventional media don't get on it because it's not what they, it doesn't include any, any murders or car wrecks or whatever, you know, so. <laughs> um, right, and now we can use our social media for good. We can really use our technology for a greater good. And that's, that's really great, girl, because, you know, the, the fact that you are using technology for this greater good is really inspiring to, to think that, you know, these, na these nature-based solutions can really get out there with that hashtag because hashtags are so powerful and yes. they, you know, they really get you categorized with the people who are using that hashtag. And then it helps you to collaborate just like we the world. And that has a lot to do with how, you know, we are able to talk about what we can do together that we can't do on our own. So, you know, it's great that you have so many beautiful based solutions, nature based solutions. Um, do you have a lot, do you have programs for children too and families um, that, you know, I, I'd just be interested to know about if you have any kind of, um, that's what I take. I take large concepts yeah. and bring it down to a, ch a child's level. And I'm also interested in, in when you do the, um, the global, um, Town halls is is nonviolent communication involved at that with that at all because it seems like that would be a really great um, fit together. It would be no, we haven't uh, been able to work that in with such a, a limited time piece right now, like one day of yeah. uh, discussions. It um, might be a nice but, collaboration with yeah, Rick to help with that problem. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thanks for that. Thanks for that idea. We'll, We'll talk about that, uh, Rick. For It'd be nice to introduce him to Tariq, too. Yeah. Tariq, Tariq did a, um, a, a, on our Unity panel, um, he did a, a movie called Free Trip to Egypt, and he has, um, for the whole month of September, the hashtag pledge to listen. That would be a really great teaming up, like when we ask that question, what can we do together? Um, I'll, I will put you two together in an email and see if there's Excellent. a, a way you. that you can maybe cross promote each other Sounds yeah great. I think yeah. that brings up that that question that uh, you know I'm always kind of looking for how how we can make all of this happen and so my question is do we need to achieve global unity and a cultural shift towards we consciousness in order to have uh, global freedom and democracy as represented at, the, at in institutions like the United Nations um, as well as to keep the, the climate crisis and the mass extinction of species from becoming irreversible in the next 10 years. And um, do you think that global freedom and democracy is possible? And the reason I'm, I'm saying that is because, as you know, there are many 
um, countries that are moving more in a fascistic direction. Um, and one of them, unfortunately, is Brazil. And right. we're seeing the results of that with, uh, you know, 70,000 fires uh, because the government was kind of uh, loosening up its, its uh, regulations about uh, doing things, you right. know, privately and in terms of the, uh, the, Am the Amazon, which mm -hmm. people call the lungs of the planet. So, mm -hmm. uh, the Amazon actually supplies one fifth of our ac oxygen for the entire planet. Yep. And, 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 um, and so anyway, so we have on the one hand, this kind of push for nationalism and fascism and, and people who are self-described nationalists call people like you and me globalists. You know, what do you mean <laughs> United Nations? They're going to uh, take over everybody's uh, sovereignty and their, their rights. So, so how do you, what do you say about uh, all, of, all of that? Well, first of all, I think the, the rise in um, nationalism and right-wing right, right -wing movements and so forth is this symptom of the shift that's taking place, especially with the, you know, the younger generations who are much more we-oriented than, than uh, older generations, culturally. Right? And uh, all of these social changes that are taking place you know, are raising red flags for the old guard. And uh, those folks that turn to nationalism and, and um, dictatorial powers and so forth, uh, it, there are obstacles right now. But this wouldn't be happening unless there was a threat to their concept of power. So the big picture, and we hope it moves fast enough, right, is that there is a shift underway that I don't think can be stopped, right? And again, back to the threat from climate, this is accelerating the shift, right? So I guess it takes that, it takes a threat for people to really, you know, focus, jump on board, understand what has to be done. So I think um, perhaps the September 23rd climate summit this fall could be a real turning point because the Secretary General is going to report on how nations have or have not reached uh, their voluntary global greenhouse gas emission reductions. And it's not going to be pretty, right? And with the Amazon burning and, of course, as you know, also in in the Democratic Republic of the Congo and other African states, huge fires there. Those are the lungs also, you know. So, and this is getting onto, in the, in the US anyway, getting onto national TV, onto the conventional networks. It's breaking through. So I see a lot of positive signs. Um, a lot of damage will be, is being done and will be done until we get there, I get to the, transformation. As far as the UN is concerned, I think our current Secretary General Guterres is the perfect person in place right now. He gets it. He understands it. The um, Maria Espinosa, the current President of the General Assembly, gets it big time. She's been very active on uh, environmental reform and she's behind the Global Pact for the Environment Movement. Right? So those leaders are out there, okay? We, need, we at the grassroots level and NGO level need to really push, support them now through uh, what's gonna happen starting the 20th of September, the strike for the environment. They've already been doing it, of course, but the, the, that entire week, 20th through the 27th, is going to be global strike. Perfect timing, of course, and it's intentional. And God bless the school kids. They're saying, we're not going to stand for this anymore, okay? Because uh, children can be, have a powerful voice, as, as, you, as you know. 
Karen, especially, you know, you work with. They change everything. They're, you know, it's amazing because they, they really have a consumer power, too. You know, I, I watched um, as I went into the schools, I, I noticed, you know, that as the, as the children started caring about the environment, more Disney and Nickelodeon and the bigger oh. corporations that were going for the kids we're talking more about the environment same thing with kindness now mm -hmm. this is this is if the kids want more kindness in the world and the kids yes. want more compassion then the adults it's it's like it's more gentle for the adults to hear it from the kids but now sure. i think what these kids are doing with the climate um balance i like to call it climate balance because I, I like to hold that energy out as as not a crisis but we're we're bringing everything in balance because i mm. think our words are our wand and i really believe that when we talk about it from a place of this is important we don't have that complacency we we speak from that Right. That's why I think these children are speaking with such integrity that the adults have to listen. And I love um, how we have the, you know, how we have the urgent message from the children and the kids get so excited and they say, if we can get a million kids to make these videos, then the the grown-ups will have to listen. And I just, I, I so identify with what they're saying because I, I've witnessed it, I've watched it. And if you, if we get enough children involved, and this is what I'm so passionate about is bringing, uniting the elders with the youth for the love of our planet, you mm. know, and that's, you know, that's why let's, I, I am. Let's, so let's give the, the link for an urgent message from. Yeah. Yeah, I will put that into the, yeah. Right. We, I'll definitely put we, that into the description, but yeah. Right. Please, if anybody we, who's we watching are, this, yeah. Anybody who's we watching this. WeYourChildren.org. WeYourChildren.org. Yeah, WeYourChildren.org. Yeah, we and um, if you're watching this because you're watching live or on the replay, you can go on over to that website and you can upload your own video of a, ch a child in your life um, who shares their message because we are going to bring that to the United Nations and we are going to put that together and as we are going to be a voice for those children and um, and Earl we invite you to do that for um, any of your community too. Absolutely absolutely yeah we've got a, a strong youth movement in in Santa Fe you know the Sunrise awesome. Movement the chapter here you know and and others that were organized before the Sunrise Movement came along. Global Warming Express is the school children's group here. Yeah, the Sunrise Movement and Extinction Rebellion yeah. are both very powerful youth-led move movements. Incredible, right. incredible organization. These youth are so good at social media and they're so good at gathering, bringing people together. You know, that's what's so amazing as I've, as I've witnessed it. I've, I've just been in awe of the way that they can organize, just like the kids from Parkland, for, you know, for right. all, they're still really going at it with, you know, with the campaign for, um, Gun for, safety. Yeah, for safety and for right. not just for that, but for, you know, um, you know, a political arena of, of people who really care, you know, these kids are really powerful. And they're not, they're not going away either. And they're not going away. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, you know, on louder. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, on the subject of freedom and democracy, one of the, the things that is concerning for me, which is uh, uh, in terms of the United States, is that we have, at the moment, we have a kind of a system that is based on the, uh, the ruling of a minority. Uh, we have more people voting for example, for the president of the United States in the 2016 election, mm -hmm. about three million more people right. voted for the Democratic candidate, and yet that didn't it, it it didn't become that person did not become the president. We have uh, gerrymandering in in our um, uh, in our um, districts, right. right, which means that. Um, in order for Democrats to get into uh, office, they have to 
get more than 8%. Uh-oh, he froze. <laughs> okay. We'll let you... We'll let you finish his sentence, Earl. Yeah. <laughs> the uh, the uh, election just, issue, you know, with the um, thank you. electoral oh, oh. college, you know, that electoral college is its remnant from the founding fathers. It was kind of a hangover from, uh, you know, uh, their understanding of, of majority authority, uh, keeping authority, and the, they didn't quite want to go for full democracy. I'm a little afraid of that, obviously. <laughs> but many states have now passed uh, resolutions or laws stating that uh, their electoral votes will, will go toward the person who wins the most votes nationwide, right? So that, that electoral college uh, grip is, is being undermined. Uh, so the popular vote is, you know, is uh, moving forward to, to over, overcome that. Right, but it's not there yet, unfortunately. No, I don't know how many states have done that yet, but that's a movement. So but that's, that's awesome. Yeah, it's great to know that there is a movement that is right. moving in that direction. Just like what you said, um, it takes people becoming aware that something is not working in order to start to make the change. Right, and the gerrymandering issue. I know there's at least one formal uh, movement working on that, and I, I believe the uh, former President Obama is part of that, uh, along with um, his former Attorney General, whose name I can't recall right now. Um, Eric, Eric Holder. Yes, yes, okay, so that's what, there's, uh, they have an organization going, working on gerrymandering uh, to try to change the law so that, you know, that process is outlawed. Um, there may be other movements too, I don't know, but at least, that is being addressed. Uh, again, voices need to be, be heard from all over uh, the country on this. Right, so, so looking at the big picture, we really need these kind of uh, freedom and democracy movements in every country, especially the most powerful countries, the countries that have uh, permanent representation on the Security Council. Yes. Because if we don't have those democracy movements in those countries, then a real reform of the United Nations may may not be happening as, as quickly as we would like it to happen, especially given the constraints that scientists are talking about with the next uh, 10 years by 2020, I mean, sorry, 2030, mm -hmm. uh, we have to cut our emissions basically in half, otherwise, Climate change and the mass extinction of species uh, may become irreversible. Right. Well, I I I think that the threat that you just expressed about climate change is is going to be what's going to um, force people to recognize uh, that change has to come about. Yeah. Uh, France uh, is uh, leading uh, the movement for the Global Pact for the Environment. Right, um, Macron's a very strong leader on this issue, uh, and he's powerful at the UN Security Council. Right, so that is out there. That's uh, that change has begun. Um, I firmly believe that in uh, January 20, 2021, you know, we will have a president who will immediately rejoin the Paris Accords, etc., 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 and uh, because. It, the uh, events like the Dorian hurricane, right? Yeah. It's going to increase. If, if people don't understand what's happening when their homes are destroyed repeatedly over and over, and they see this happening worldwide, it, it's the wake up call. And people are I waking up. I want to ask this just from the point. I like to ask this just from the point of somebody who is just happening to be watching the news, just happens to be watching the news. I just want to kind of be yeah. on that side. So okay. 
a lot of the time the news will say that these kind of things have happened before and that this is not you know this is not unusual to have this horrible these horrible storms and mm -hmm. they try and so I'm, I'm just wondering how can people become more educated Earl so that they can really feel more empowered in their own town in their own town hall in their own city right well on the news uh, side of it I have noticed in recent months that uh, there's a shift taking place there also there's more recognition of the facts like uh, this storm is so powerful because the oceans are warmer than they used to be all right so those science science pieces are coming out in the news uh, they, you know they're little little fragments little factoids but then that's real important because the people hear that well why is the ocean warmer than it used to be right the, the connection to climate change right so that is happening and I think that's a result of a lot of pressure again by nonprofit organizations mm -hmm. uh, which about two, what two weeks ago I think that the in the US the conventional media began talking about the fires in Brazil yeah and they had been going on for some time before that and there was a huge uh, pressure campaign on those uh, media outlets you know to get this on the news yeah break through and to get it in their consciousness so again you know so it's up to us on the, in the grassroots to pressure the institutions to do what they have to do it always has been that way and always will be that way uh, so it's really a matter of more and more people getting involved with, with we.net you know learning uh, you're connected to so many organizations so much information you know that they can learn a lot there often a lot they can connect to the global town hall in Pittsburgh and learn an immense amount there uh, there will be another global town hall probably in April in Minneapolis We'll get word out on that once that's you know, organized. And then I'll be doing a lot of work uh, with the Common Home of Humanity, bringing that out to people's understanding of how that global treaty proposal is not just for nation state uh, leaders to sign on to, yeah. it's we have a local to global network of people being involved in decision making about the science that says what their nation needs to do to bring down global uh, emissions, et cetera, et cetera. And it's, it's a beautiful proposal that's science based. Right. And I recommend people look at commonhomeofhumanity.org and begin to become acquainted with that. So, yeah. so definitely um, you're starting to answer that question what can we do together? Uh, that we can't do on our own. And um, so do you want to uh, give that uh, website again for Common Home of Humanity and also um, for a global voice so right. people can get in touch with, connect with you and support the work that you're doing? Sure, global, it's globalvoice.solutions is the, the website for Global Voice. And Common Home of Humanity is commonhomeofhumanity.org. And you reminded me of something, Mike. The, the other night I was watching the CNN uh, uh, cycle with the 2020 Democratic candidates, the climate discussions. And uh, Mayor Pete Buttigieg from Indiana was on, and they would ask a question about some issue. I forgot what it was now. Uh, and his response was, was really interesting. He said, well, this is a problem that we can't solve alone. That's why uh, humans invented government to help solve problems that no one person, no one state, et cetera, can solve alone. We need to work together. And if people think of government in that way. Yeah. It's, something, it's something we invented. You know, it wasn't imposed on us. And you know, we vote, we run through office, we lobby, we, we take responsibility for making things happen through our local, state, national, and uh, uh, global governance. We don't have a global government per se, but we still can have a voice at the UN through nonprofit organizations. 
So, you know, that's why, um, well, I think I'm here. Oh. Um, so that's why I uh, would want to promote the idea of moving towards government of, by, and for the people, mm -hmm. because a lot of, there's a lot of cynicism out there about government. And um, that what government was supposed to be <laughs> for the right. people, wasn't it? <laughs> it's supposed to be of, by, and for yeah, people. But if it's of, by, and for, how did, we get, how did we get so far away from that? That it sounds yeah. like it sounds like when you're talking about it, that it sounds like it's almost a pipe dream to have a government for the people. <laughs> right, because I, I, because of money in politics, right? Yeah, yep. money in politics. So, so if we can yeah, and too many complacent people that were all along in not knowing about what those people with money in politics were doing do, right. do you feel that way i feel like it just feels like there's so much more people getting involved now it feels like there's yeah. no complacency you're either like really involved or you really don't care but there's yeah. really no in the middle of the complacency anymore i think so yeah yeah yes. So is that, is that part of the shift too, would you say, Earl? I think so, because you know, people are realizing that the, in the US, for example, the economy is not working for them. Even mm -hmm. though it's been promised over and over, it's working for the rich. And they see that. They see they haven't had a pay raise in 20 years or whatever. They see, and all this information is coming out almost every day about the 1% owning 50% you know, of the wealth or whatever it is of the nation. This is repeated over and over and over. So uh, people are getting that. And I, you see a lot of support for what are fairly, seen it fairly radical programs in some of the Democratic candidates. Not radical in my view, but from a conventional point of view. And they're gaining a lot of support. Uh, they want to take their country back. There's also an interesting uh, global democracy project out there. Um, that is looking at the long range of how to, uh, and associated with a, a um, parliamentary assembly at the, at the UN, to have global elections bypass the nation state mechanism, right? But have people directly vote for their representative to go to a UN parliamentary assembly. That's a strong movement. And just search parla UN parliamentary assembly or global democracy and this will come up. All right, this is, this is gaining a lot of steam also. It's part of the shit. We're getting it. We're being pressured to get it faster than we have been. Uh, there's a lot of hope, but we cannot take a break. Uh, I really appreciate you, Earl. I really appreciate what you're doing and being and, and who you're being in the world. And I just want to say, Thank you. A deep bow, a really deep bow for all the work that you're doing in, in yeah. our world. And so grateful that you're giving a voice to so many that ha didn't have a voice before. So it's such a blessing to be able to feel the energy of your passion of how this has, you know, you have faith and hope that that's going to give a lot of people who are watching this show. So remember what we're, we always say about that, you know, think about, if you think you can make a difference, you can, one person yeah. can make a huge difference. And if you feel that way, then you can really reach out to any of these organizations and say, I'd like to volunteer, right? Rick, we yeah. have so many ways that people can join. I was just on the, I'm, I'm one of the WE team. And I have been a uh, partner in WE with um, the WE the World since 2016. And really excited to watch how much it's really been able to blossom because so many of us are coming in and saying, yeah, I, I wanna be able to do something to help. And I'd like to get more involved in what you're doing, Earl, too. I mean, how do people get involved in that if they want to do more of a um, of a, a global town hall in their area? Well, on the uh, globalvoice.solutions website, there's a uh, contact message form to fill out and send in, and it'll it'll come to my my email, and I'll get right back in touch with anybody who wants to uh, connect that way. Awesome. 
So you're you're seeing the shift accelerate in the we organization too, aren't you? Oh, absolutely. I'm seeing, you know what I'm really noticing because I've been a nonprofit myself, NGO, you know, and I've watched what, you know, what we thought we could do by ourselves <laughs> is is um, really, really being, there's a light being shined that we can do so much more in collaboration. And, mm -hmm. um, and when people stop thinking about what's in it for me and they mm -hmm. go to we, yep. <laughs> Flip that over to do a W. Yeah, we see, we see it. I see it everywhere now. I see it. Yeah. I see more and more people are going from what's in it for me for what's to what's in it for we. So exactly. Yeah. So yeah. as we wind up, um, let's give people ways that they can connect uh, in in uh, and be part of we. So as you mentioned, Karen, uh, people can join the we team. Uh, and if they go to we.net, right on the homepage, there's a place where people can sign up to become a volunteer and join the, the WE team. Uh, they can sign up their organizations uh, to participate with the 11 Campaigns for Change, which goes all year round. Um, and then there's also the Global Unity Calendar which is a wonderful resource. It's a free public international calendar that allows people to uh, post their events from around the world and their announcements so that people can begin to see what's going on. And, and it's, it's a great resource for people that when, when you post on our calendar, it shows up on multiple websites. Um, so that uh, with other organizations that have synchronized their calendars with ours, uh, so um, it, it becomes like a, um, a broadcast of your, of your upcoming events, which is, is really great. And um, then people can go to our Facebook page. It's the We Campaign on Facebook. Um, and Twitter. Uh, we have our Twitter. You can go to twitter.com forward slash the we campaign. And um, if you follow us, we follow you back. And we would love to have you join our beautiful family of the we team because it's really an incredible, supportive, inc wonderful group of people who really care about our planet. And um, you'll be really inspired to be a part of this. Right. So that's our three eyes that we uh, try to accomplish our, that's what this is, right? The three um, eyes that make a we. Inspire, <laughs> inform, and involve. Right. Three eyes that make a we. <laughs> so, well, thank you, thank you, Rick, for your commitment over these years to make this, make this happen, bring we to where it is. And Karen, thank you so much for joining and really helping this blossom even more. As you guys are doing great work. You know, signing on to We as a volunteer is a great place for people to start. Uh, so I just, I just want to uh, confirm that, you know, you guys are doing, doing the work that needs to be done. Thank you, and you too, Earl. Thank you for leading the way with global uh, freedom and democracy and governance and getting the, the voice of the people at the highest levels of power. Log on to the Pittsburgh Global Town Hall live stream and join us. There you go. So um, I'd like to end with the wonderful quote from our dear friend Jonathan Granoff. At the uh, launch of the WE campaign, he said, I hope WE expand so much that there is no longer any them. Ah. <laughs> right? Yes, that's great. So thank you again. Yeah, thank you. Bye bye. Thank bye -bye. you, everybody. And make sure you share this broadcast. That's a big way that you can help by sharing the broadcast. And also type in the chat where you're watching from because we want to connect with you and we want to hear more about where you're, what you're doing in your corner of the world. And keep growing the unity in your community. We need more unity in our community. Thank you so much, everybody.